So I've had the honor of giving orthopedic emergencies all within 30 minutes. Um, I think I've covered most everything that would be included in emergency. So if you guys walk out of here not knowing every orthopedic emergency, it is your fault, not mine. Okay. Um, no. So I just covered some of the high yield stuff that I thought was important. There's going to be a lot missing. Um, general rule of orthopedics, though, there's very few occasions where it's a true emergency. Um, the things that we consider true emergencies, like open fractures, compartment syndrome, neck fash, those are things that are usually pretty obvious that you're going to be transferring fairly quickly. Okay, I'm talking about few, a few of the subtle things that people don't classically categorize as emergencies. Now I'm going to cover some of the common things that we see as well. I'm trying to throw in a little bit of new stuff with a lot of old stuff. So a lot of this is going to be a review, but I'm trying to add some of the newer stuff in just to keep those of you interested who are pretty familiar with this. So why do we care about orthopedic emergencies? Um, for any of you who've worked in the ER for any stretch of time know a large portion of the people that we see that come in have some kind of orthopedic complaint. It is the most common disabling work injury in the U.S. About one-fourth of all disabling injuries are orthopedic related. One-third of all injuries that we see in the emergency room are orthopedic based. Um, and then again, it's very prominent in athletes. We see it a lot in our pediatric population. Um, and then there's some congenital component to it as well. Missed injuries, when we're talking about orthopedic injuries, is bad for the patients, but it's bad for us. Um, these tend to be pretty high up on the malpractice cases. You see two studies um, that were done, one in the UK. Out of 105 of the negligence claims, about a third of them were involving missed fractures. And then the same thing from Journal of Emergency Medicine, 550 malpractice claims, about 17% of those involved orthopedic injuries, pretty high payout rate for those. So these are things we don't want to miss. We want to know how to treat these things. Um, so after talking to some of my orthopedic friends, some community ER doctors, we kind of came up with a list of just generalized tips to help you guys minimize your risk. So I call this the tips and pitfalls section. So one view is probably one of the worst things you can do, and I see it all too often. Someone gets one view or they get three very inadequate views, and you're not able to see what you need to see. So in this case, if you just saw these two images, you probably missed that fracture right there on the proximal phalanx. Um, so make sure that when you get your images, you look at all your images, and make sure that you're getting the appropriate images for what you're looking for. There's a general rule that our orthopedic doctors tell us is if you have an injury of a joint, always x-ray the joint above and the joint below. Sorry. So the same thing, if you were to look at just one plain foam right here of the hand, you probably don't see a whole lot going on, but then when you look at the oblique view and the lateral view, you can see a subtle fracture right there on the fifth metacarpal. Um, always provide, always perform a detailed neurological and muscular skeletal exam on all injuries. Okay? One of the most common complaints that I hear from my orthopedic doctors is they get a transferred in with the patient saying neurovascularly intact, but that patient comes in and they have paresthesias or they have some kind of deficit where that patient probably should have been reduced earlier because of this neurological deficit. Two-point discrimination is the gold standard. So if you're not doing this, you don't have to use the fancy tools. Just take a paper clip and test <coughs> usually the extremities is what we're talking about in this case. One of the newer things that I'm going to recommend, and I'm going to talk just a hint on this later on, is nerve blocks. Um, nerve blocks, when you're talking about orthopedic injuries, is one of the newer modalities controlling pain, and it's great. You're using less anesthetic. You're not having to sedate patients anymore. It's safer, more reliable pain control, and longer duration of pain control. I'm going to talk to you guys about one specific one later on. If you want to learn more about it, Rich Gordon does a three-hour lecture on all the different types of nerve blocks, so we can get it to you. In the pediatric population, if you would be thinking about a ligament injury in the adult, be thinking about a growth plate injury in the pediatric world. Okay? And that leads me to my next slide, in which if you're ever questioning about a patient having an injury, just splint them. Okay, it's always better to over splint than under splint. A lot of times you're not going to see the acute fracture or the acute ligament injury um, on your imaging or on your physical exam. So if you're in doubt, just splint them. It's going to provide the follow up, it's going to improve patient satisfaction. Um, and they can always get another x ray a week later with their family doctor to evaluate to see if there is a true fracture or not. So I'm an advocate of splinting. When I'm ever concerned, I just splint.
always remove the cast. If a patient comes in and they have a splint or they have a cast on and there's any complaint under it, just remove it. You're better off making sure there's nothing going on. And most of the time there's not. But there's been a few cases where I've been surprised and I've seen compartment syndrome under a cast or a blister that's become infected and spreading to become cellulitis. So just make sure you remove it. Um, there have been a few times where I've had people come in after a third or fourth visit and I remove the cast and they have something significant going on under there. You don't want to be the person who's missed that. Always try to control the bleeding. If you don't control bleeding, you're going to miss obvious injuries like an arterial laceration um, or a dirty wound. Best ways to control the bleeding, tourniquet. If you have a distal extremity injury, just put a tourniquet on. Easiest way to take a blood pressure cuff, pump it up to a pressure higher than the systolic. That allows you to get good visualization of the wound, clean it out, repair an arterial laceration or another injury, and you can remove that tourniquet later on. Tourniquets on extremities for an hour to two hours will not cause any harm to that patient. Okay? Um, orthopedics go into the OR and they place tourniquets on for hours at a time and patients don't have complications. So, And then always think about compartment syndrome in your long bone injuries. Um, people tend to forget about compartment syndrome. They try to, they usually only think about it in the femur fractures. Don't forget your forearm fractures can cause it, your tibial fibula can cause it. So just think about it. Um, if you're ever concerned about a patient with an acute injury who's having a lot of swelling acutely on, keep them there for an hour or two just to observe them to make sure it's not progressing to compartment syndrome. This is just a reminder about your five Ps. Um, if you're getting down to the pallor and pulselessness, you're way too late in your diagnosis. You should be catching it up here where paresthesia and pain are the signs. Only way to truly diagnose this is to get a pressure. Um, you know, anything greater than 20 is concerning. Anything greater than 30 should be going to the OR. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about specifics. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a very non-truly orthopedic um, related injury, but something that's changed in care over the past 10 years, subingual hematomas. So traditional teaching of these subingual hematomas is that if it involved more than 50% of your nail bed, you would remove the nail. Okay. These are considered, remember, hematomas with a tough fracture, so a fracture underneath it, are considered open fractures. And so the debate came as to when you remove this nail, are you turning a closed fracture into an open fracture? Not really, they're already open. But removing the nail bed has decreased overall healing, um, caused increase in paresthesia, complications later on. So the newer modern approach is we only remove the nail if there is underlying injury to the surrounding tissues or to the nail plate. Otherwise, just trephination alone can take care of your subequal hematomas. Um, here's an example of just a trephination. You just take a cautery. You can also take an 18 gauge needle and just drill a little hole into it. It's very simple. All you're trying to do is to make a hole enough big enough to get the blood coming out. And that's all you have to do. Um, so is it considered an open fracture? Yes. Should the nail be removed? No, not unless there's underlying injury to the nail bed. Should antibiotics be given? Research shows no. Unless it's a complicated fracture where the patient's a diabetic and has a dirty wound, you don't have to do antibiotics. These things tend to heal very well. Even though it's an open fracture, this is one case you don't have to give antibiotics. Don't forget to update tetanus on all these subingual hematomas. Um, if there is a tough fracture, the distal extremity should be splinted for about three to four weeks, and then you can have them follow up with their primary doctor. Fight bite, this is something we see very commonly. Our goal in the ER is to make sure it doesn't turn into this. Okay? Um, and if you don't do an appropriate job on it, this is what they do turn into. Remember, any laceration that is lying over the knuckles, just assume it's a fight bite. Our patients all lie. Um, and I don't think I've ever had a patient come in and say, yeah, I punched somebody in the face. Well, it just doesn't happen. So all these wounds, all these fight bites, they need to be irrigated. They need to be examined with the patient in full extension and flexion. Okay? These are, you will miss a subtle ligament or bony injury if you don't do a full evaluation on these patients. Um, treatment of choice is going to be augmenting. Right? You're trying to cover anaerobes from oral <coughs> mucosa. If the patient's allergic to augmenting, you can try things like clindamycin or doxycycline. Um, always get an x-ray. Um, I have x-rayed these people and found pieces of teeth in their hands, foreign bodies in the hands. So make sure you get the x-ray, get the um, tetanus updated. I bring all these patients back. All right? These are wounds that get dirty quickly, even on antibiotics, and 
become a mess. They, all the compartments in the hand, they spread very quickly. And so I always bring these patients back in 24 hours just to make sure it's not progressing. If it does progress, you're at risk of developing tenosynovitis. Now, pyogenic tenosynovitis is a little bit different. There are two types. You've got chronic and pyogenic. The one we care about is pyogenic. This is a true orthopedic emergency. All right, so if you have these signs, which are your classic canaval signs, this is a transfer, an orthopedic consult immediately. Don't send these patients home. All right. um, these infections will spread just like neck fast very quickly up into the arm. If they don't get treated quickly, these patients have a risk of losing a digit um, and becoming septic quickly. Broad spectrum antibiotics should be started and then just get them to the right place. Boxer's fracture. Um, again, these patients, it's never from punching anybody, it's from falling. Um, but it's usually involving this fifth metacarpal. Um, two things you really need to be looking for. The first one is you want to evaluate for rotational deformity. So when you close your fingers, when you flex them, all the fingers should point toward your thenar prominence or your scaphoid bone. Um, if at any point they're not pointing or they're overlapping, that is a rotational deformity and that needs to be reduced. Okay. The other thing is angulation. So this is where your x-ray comes in. There is a 10... 20, 30, 40 rule, where the second digit should not have more than a 10 degree angulation, and the fifth one should not have more than a 40 degree of angulation. If it goes beyond that, those need to be reduced. And this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a nerve block. So these are very painful reductions, and most people don't like to sedate because it's a very relatively minor injury. But if you can do an ulnar nerve block, these patients will be pain free. You can get a nice splint on there that mobilizes it, get them followed up, and the patients do a lot better doing this. It's a very easy one to do as well. So you have your probe, and you're going to have it placed just on your anterior portion of your forearm, right over your ulnar prominence, and you're going to get your ulnar artery in view. Sitting right next to your ulnar artery is your ulnar nerve. And as you slide up the arm, you're going to see this nerve dip away from the artery. So you see it dip away right there. And this is where you're going to inject. And you basically just want to bathe that artery. So you stick your needle in plane with the probe. You want to bathe that um, nerve in about 10 to 15 cc's of bupivacaine, lidocaine, whatever you have available. You want to make sure you get it completely encircled. And that provides anesthesia to where you can completely reduce that bone and they will have no pain. It's a very easy block to do. Treatment for boxer's fracture, you're going to put them in an ulnar gutter splint. Um, the MPC joint is going to be held in 90 degrees, wrist extend to 30 degrees, so it's kind of like holding a Coke can is what they call it. Um, and then you can refer them off. Uh, just a little bit about reviewing of x-rays. I think the lateral view of the elbow is probably the most important view to look at. Two lines you really need to know, your anterior humeral line and your radial capitellar line. Both of these lines should intersect in the middle third of your capitellum. So in this case, this is good. You have to make sure you have a true lateral view. If you don't have a true lateral view, all this goes out the door. If at any point these do not line up like they should be, you have to be worried about a supracondylar or a radial head fracture. You also have two fat pads to worry about. Your anterior fat pad, which can be normal. When you start getting an injury or a fracture, you get a hematoma. That hematoma pushes up that fat pad, and you get this typical sail sign. So in this case, it's flat. In this case, you get the sail sign. This is suggestive of a fracture. This is normal. Posterior fat pad should never be present. So if you see a posterior fat pad, that is suggestive of an acute injury. Pediatrics, we think more about supracondylar fractures. In the adult population, we think more about radial head fractures. Supracondylar fractures, so in this case, are highly associated with neurovascular injury, usually to the anterior and interosseous nerve. This causes forearm weakness, so this innervates those deep muscles of your forearm. So if you don't pick this up early, these patients can have some dramatic decrease in their function um, of their ability to work. And then brachial artery injury, we see this more in the pediatric population. So always make sure you check pulses on a regular basis in your pediatric population that have this injury. Um, Standard of treatment for this, if it's non-displaced, you can splint it at 90 degrees and have them follow up. If it is displaced, that's an emergent orthopedic consult for repair. Same thing for the radial head fracture. So if it's displaced less than 2 millimeters, those can be sent home on a spling. And really, they don't need to follow up with anyone. They can just start using it as they tolerate it. I usually tell them to follow up with their primary doctor or send to orthopedics just to get rechecked to make sure it is healing. 
displace fractures, you can splint them and have a follow-up in one week. And again, pediatric population, make sure you are checking the pulses on these patients on a regular basis. So at least for an hour after injury, make sure that there's no intimal injury. So Fouche injury, so fall on the outstretched hand. Um, again, don't forget about compartment syndrome. They are not common, but I've seen it a few times in forearm fractures causing compartment syndrome. Um, Collies and Smith fractures are the most common we see. So Collies fracture is where you fall with your wrist in the flexion, or I'm sorry, in the extension, and you get this dinner fork deformity as a dorsal displacement of the distal fragment. So you get dorsal displacement in this part. Um, in this case, when you are reducing this, sedation is going to be key. So you got to make sure these patients are sedated because you're trying to recreate the injury. This is extremely difficult to reduce if you don't have the patient completely relaxed and sedated. So deep sedation, if you're trying to do this with morphine and Versed, you're probably not going to get a great reduction on that. These um, Collies fractures tend to cause a acute compartment syndrome, so medial nerve injury. So make sure you're checking for that. And then Smith's fracture is the exact opposite, where you have volar displacement. Um, it's your reverse thinner fork. And both of these, you just reduce them and put them in a sugar tong splint and have them follow up with orthopedics within about a week. Now, this is more board style type stuff, Montage and Galeazzi, um, French terms. Easy way to remember it is mugger. Um, so in this case, you have a radial fracture. And so that's going to be a Galeazzi fracture. So it's going to be a radial fracture with dislocation of your radial ulnar um, joint. So Montage is just the opposite. You have an ulnar fracture with dislocation of your radial head. Both of these are orthopedic <coughs> emergencies, so these are not easy to reduce. You have a ring, and trying to get two rings lined up is almost impossible to do that closed reduction. And so these patients go to the OR and they get pinned. Um, I would not even bother trying to reduce these in the ER. Um, Galeazzi is much more common um, than your Montasia. Um, again, neurovascular injury, not very common with the Galeazzi, more common with your Montasia. And the last one is your nice stick fracture. So um, this is just a fracture of your middle third of your ulna. Um, these typically can just be splinted and followed up. Only caveat is if you have a large degree of um, angulation, then they probably need an orthopedic referral. The last thing I really want to talk about is your pelvic fractures. These can be the most dangerous fractures, and they can be missed commonly. Um, and they have a lot of injuries that can concomitantly occur with them. So your pelvis is protecting numerous organs. Um, the hemorrhage is kind of the biggest thing. You can bleed over two liters into your pelvis and not even know it. This is not something you're going to pick up on the FAST exam most of the time unless there's other injuries in the abdomen. So unless you're thinking about this, you can easily miss it. In a young person, that amount of bleeding might not be evident until it's too late, okay, because they're compensating. Um, most of the time, the bleeding is going to be venous. Uh, about 10% of the time, it will be arterial. Anytime you have an unstable patient who has a suspected pelvic fracture, you need to put them in a pelvic binder. And it's not that the pelvic binder stops the bleeding, but you decrease the compartment space, and you basically form a tamponade effect. So you bleed into the area, it eventually tamponades itself, but instead of bleeding into an area where two liters can bleed into it, you're hopefully reducing it to about a liter of one liter area of bleeding into. Um, and approximately... 35% of patients with a pelvic fracture are going to require a transfusion at some point in time. Remember the pelvic ring, it is a ring, so like your forearms, you, typically if you have one break, you need to look for another break in it. The only time this typically doesn't happen is in the elderly population where they can have single breaks. X-ray is very limited in your sensitivity, so if you have a negative X-ray in someone you highly suspect or can't walk, you need to go ahead and proceed to a CT scan. Um, treat these as open fractures, so antibiotics, tetanus, um, non-immobilizing, so don't have them up and walking and get surgical stabilization. Um, it depends on where you are as to whether these patients go to the OR or they go to the IR suite to get embolized. Cool. Last thing we're going to talk about is amputations. Um, people do stupid stuff. Okay. He's not the stupid one. He's the stupid one. So, it's dumb. So amputations, all of them are, consider them all as a traumatic injury, level one trauma, all right? So ABCs, in this case, you're going to focus on the C initially. So tourniquet these injuries. Um, 
This one, probably not quite as easy to tourniquet as this one. Um, you know, this one, I'm probably just going to be holding a lot, a lot of pressure and putting on some hemostatic gauze. This one, you can tourniquet fairly easily. Again, these are all open fractures until proven otherwise. Um, as far as the amputated limb, you want to keep the limb clean, wash it off with some saline, put it in some clean gauze, put it into a bag, and then from the bag, put it onto ice. You don't ever want to put the exterminal lead directly on ice, otherwise you'll cause frostbite. If you do it appropriately, you can increase viability of the limb four to six to eight hours. So this is not uh, coming to the ER, you've been gone for one hour, you're going to lose your limb. Go ahead and try to protect it and then send them out with the limb on ice. Okay. So just to summarize, very few orthopedic emergencies, um, but just be thinking about the big ones, you know, the compartment syndromes, your tennis synovitis. Most of the other ones you're going to get, you know, the, the open fractures, the montageous galeosis, those are pretty obvious. Um, but the, the subtle ones, you know, the fight bites and stuff like that, think about those because those are the ones that progress and are most commonly missed. Any questions? Thank you.